Welcome to the program. Almost 30 years ago, a domestic... I just cannot believe how fast 11 and a half years in the anchor's seat have passed. Welcome to the program. Those stories shortly, but first, will the jailing of crime family matriarch Judy Welcome Moran... Special edition of 7.30 is an institution, simple as that. No other program on Australian television has its scope. There have been so many people, so many stories, it's impossible to remember them all. But with everything we do, there's one question viewers ask me more than anything else. Why don't they answer the question? Palmer, I, I, I'm free to say what I want to. I haven't, Mr. I haven't Palmer, answered I would answering like your you, question. If the interview is so going to carry on like this... If you want me to continue like the interview, I suggest you keep quiet. Mr well, Palmer, look, if you've got nothing to hide, I'm just wondering suppress. why you can't answer a question well, relating to, to the an point answer. that you just made. Please don't interrupt me so much I that I can't even finish a sentence. I won't interrupt you if you answer the question. I'm Looking at the budget big picture, do you agree with that? Well, let's make a few points about my EFA, about this well, update. Or you could just answer my question. Can't you just answer that question clearly? Would you vote for same-sex marriage I'll, or something? I'll use my words. You can use yours, and you're not allowed to put words no, no, in my I, mouth. I would like, I I would like clarity. That I, That's got plans. nothing to do with what I just asked you. No, but it's an important point. Prime Minister, Lee, none of that answers... Do... No, I'm sorry to interrupt, but none of that answers my question of where the money's coming sorry from. Sorry to keep well, interrupting, just... but I just feel that I'm yeah. asking clear questions and you're not answering them. I ask the Your questions audience on this are, program. Are... You were pretty loose with the truth today, weren't you, when you said that BHP's decision to put the Olympic Dam project on hold was partly due to the federal government's new taxes? Not at all, Lee. Have you actually read BHP's statements? No, but... You haven't read their statements today, but, you, but you're on commenting about what they've announced today and how the federal government's to blame for that. Lee, I, I didn't say that the carbon tax and the mining tax were solely to blame. These things seem really obvious, that you'd want a driver with an international flight crew vaccinated and that they would be having the daily test. It's not rocket science. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for that, Lee, but uh, the reality is that we are in a uh, one in 100 year pandemic and it's, it's the unknown unknowns. Do you reckon that the audience would buy that an unvaccinated driver picking up an infection from an international flight crew is an unknown unknown? Well, it was, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this also. There are other factors. Nothing is ever simple um, in a pandemic. I think our system works extremely well. But it'll but... only keep working extremely well if you don't mess up these tiny details. Oh, well, look, it's great to be expert uh, when you're not doing the job, I guess. In actual numbers, how many facilities does that mean around the country in Australia, aged care facilities, have not had vaccination yet in, in an actual uh, well, number? Uh, in Victoria, uh, we have nine to complete tomorrow. Victoria's actually what at about almost nationally? 99%. Uh, and around Australia, prior to today, because we haven't had today's uh, figures come in, we had 74 still to go, but today there will be significant numbers. 74 still to go. You said on the 16th of February that it would take six weeks. We know these are the most vulnerable people in the country. How can 74 places not have been vaccinated yet? By tomorrow, we expect that uh, all of those facilities, um, subject to uh, no incidents occurring, but all of those facilities in Victoria. So, let if me you're read to you again. Let uh, me read quibbling to you about a 99 more. or a 98 percent. Oh, uh, I'm not quibbling. I'm speaking so on behalf of the families and the residents of the 74 facilities that you've just revealed. So, if COVID now rips through an unvaccinated aged care facility, that's on you or Minister Colbeck, right? <laughs> There was plenty of ducking and weaving every time a Prime Minister was knifed too, and that was pretty regularly. After hours of drama, which led to a leadership ballot, an extraordinary political showdown is coming to a head. Of course the government can uh, prevail against uh, Mr Abbott at the next election. Uh, and that's why I'm supporting with, with the government. With Julia Gillard as the, the leader? Minister, under, under the Prime Minister's leadership uh, to do so. Under this Prime Minister's uh, leadership? In, yeah, under the Prime Minister's leadership to do so. Under, under Prime, Prime Minister, Minister Julia Gillard? I just said that. Under Prime Minister Gillard's leadership. The numbers, 61 to 39, reveal a significant groundswell of discontent. Australia is looking at the possibility of a new Prime Minister, the fifth in five years. Rudd, Gillard, Rudd again, Abbott, and now possibly Turnbull. But things are moving very fast in Canberra tonight. Will Scott Morrison have what it takes? Treasurer, let's just cut straight to the chase. Sure. In your view, is there a legitimate threat to Malcolm Turnbull's leadership in play? No, I, I don't believe so. 
who or what then is the source of this destabilisation that we're seeing? Well, I don't know. I'd have to ask you and the media who are reporting it. Well, are you suggesting that it's a media beta? No, I'm just the saying answer? that those stories are in the paper, so whoever's talking to the papers or would know the answer to that question, but I wouldn't. What I'm asking is, why do you think that's going on? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. Well, I'm asking you. You're but here as the But I don't know treasurer. because I'm not part of it, so well, I can't tell you. Domestic politics have been tumultuous for sure, but so have world affairs. It's hard to believe there's another war in Europe, although some people did see it coming. How much of a threat to global security do you consider the Russian President Vladimir Putin? I think he is the premier and most important threat, more so than ISIS. Even before the invasion of Ukraine, the world's been shaken by a series of history-making events. So big thank you, June the 23rd, there's another 12 weeks. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. Yeah! Is it fair to say your biggest regret is the Brexit referendum? No, I, I came to the view that it was really becoming inevitable. Boris Johnson, what do you think of the degree of stage management of modern political campaigns? I think voters are very sophisticated, uh, Lee. I think they can see through too much stage management. Congratulations, Mr. President. I am the chosen one. By your decisions in 2016, what part have you personally played in delivering the world a president that you yourself describe as morally unfit for the role? I don't know. I hope and pray none. I am going to instruct my Attorney General to look into your situation. I don't know why he treated me the way he did, and none of his explanations, frankly, hold water. Do you feel better or worse with each day that passes from election night? I uh, get more concerned every day. We had an election that was stolen from us. Your book makes it clear that you're heavily guided by your Christian faith and family values. How do you reconcile that with having been the spokesperson for a president who has misled the American people on everything from coronavirus to climate change, who boasts about grabbing women on the pussy, who paid hush money to a porn star to keep her quiet about their alleged relationship, and who's maligned the men and women of America's armed forces? Oh, well, some of those things are just patently false, but I can They're tell you actually. from my experience, when the liberal uh, mob was attacking me, when the liberals were kicking me out of restaurants, making fun of my hair, my makeup, my fitness to be a parent, saying I should be choked, telling me that I'm vile, not even human, it was the president who was defending I me. I noticed that you're not addressing the central premise of my question, which is how somebody like Donald Trump squares with the values you espouse. Look, I, I don't look to any individual person to give me perfection. I'm not looking for a savior in politics. I have that in my faith. There is no perfect person, only one. And as far as I know, he's never run for office. I've never seen Jesus Christ's name on a ballot. If I do, I'll be sure to vote for him. Oh my God, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're the one that karate chopped Sarah in the Adam's apple. I know it's a Me Too movement. I'm coming over to the phone to hug the phone. I'm hugging the phone right now, okay? I didn't realize this was you, Lee. Congratulations on you. Remind me to show you this interview when this is over, okay? All right, go ahead, Lee. You've got to respect people who show up to be interviewed, especially on a bad day. Sometimes there's one or two hours notice, like when the ABC chairman, Justin Milne, decided to quit. He walked in and told me that he was going to resign on air. Will you be continuing as ABC chairman? No, Lee, I, I won't. Well, I think actually I should resign. Is it logical Thank to assume that a company expects something in return if they pay the dues for employees? No, it's not, Lee. No, I don't think so. I do like going to a press conference. Thanks a lot. Prime Minister, on the future, will you bring on a spill and open up the, leader, the Liberal leadership to a vote in order to bring speculation to an end? Well, <laughs> you're the speculator, Lee. Uh, I assure you me. that a lot of people on your backbench are speculating but, as well, but, Prime Minister. Well, Lee, the thing is that we were elected uh, because people were sick of chaos. Are you prepared, are you prepared to call a spill no. to bring to an end this leadership? I especially like it when people have repeatedly refused an interview. Thanks for coming. It's kind of a privilege to have you at one of my press conferences. 
So are you going to put the state into a five day lockdown every time you have two or three new cases a day? This is not the 2020 virus. This is a very different virus. And if you want to look at systems that can't handle things, well, have a look at Europe. Cutting police sales from the 7.30 program. Good. In 1993, you accompanied to court a priest who was a confessed pedophile and was then convicted. I had no idea of the enormity of and the number of Ridsdale's uh, uh, crimes. And, you knew uh, there were some, though? Well, obviously, you've been charged. So why did you accompany him to the court? As a, a priestly act of uh, solidarity. I, in retrospect, uh, I didn't realise then what a wrong impression it would give to the, uh, to the victim. Are you sorry? Three, two, one. Grants, uh, <laughs> you make me laugh now. I'm going to have to start again. <laughs> I haven't even started the interview. You've already made me laugh. <laughs> president Osmani, it's Lee Sales here. I'm the president of the program. In, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, President. It's Lee Sales. I'm the anchor of the program in Sydney. I can't Can hear, you hear you for the moment. The long-time king of talkback radio, John Laws, has weighed in on the furor surrounding his former 2UE stablemate and rival, Alan Jones. John Laws seems to be one of those interviews everyone remembers. When the image came up from his apartment in Woolloomooloo, I remember thinking, please, God, don't let the crew ask him to put his drink down before this interview starts. This is gold. Do you want me to get angry? If you want me to get angry, I'll get angry. I'm a, I'm a performer. You tell me what you want me to do. I don't want you to do anything. I'm just asking, is your view on Alan Jones consistent to your view on him in the past? Yeah, I, yes, I still, I still believe that Alan is... Uh, uh, is very good at hypocrisy. John Laws, thank you very much for making time to speak to us tonight. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it, did you? <laughs> yeah, I loved every minute. The week after it went to air, I went into a bar and they gave me a free drink, some kind of bourbon cocktail in honour of that interview. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time this evening. How does... We had the Russian ambassador one time and he just looked so Cold War and he was so beautifully contemptuous of my question. Are the two Russian diplomats who've been expelled, in fact, spies, as has been suggested? A uh, very funny question, actually. I would be happy to see you ask this question any of ambassadors here in Canberra. Oh, Shane Warne, one of my all-time favourites. Absolutely loved him. So much charisma. Just fun from the second he walked in. Oh, sorry, Shane. That's okay. Footsies. <laughs> Don't, I was going to leave that for a bit later in the interview. <laughs> I've got a bit of rapport going. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm feeling it though. Don't worry. It's good, okay. excellent. Good. Shane, it's lovely to meet you. Yes, nice to be met. Ah! Got him. Warney was top of my interview wish list almost from the day I started at 7.30. He appealed to me because he just struck me as so unapologetically who he was. He never pretended to be something he wasn't. He owned it. I respected that. Perception doesn't always equal reality. And I'm not a human headline. And just because you make a few mistakes, it doesn't mean you're all of those things. Um, you know, you might make some silly choices and some silly mistakes, but that doesn't mean you're an, an idiot. In your dreams at night, do you ever dream that you're still playing cricket? No, my dreams don't involve cricket. <laughs> I can promise you. <laughs> Quick, cut, <laughs> cut. <laughs> no, my dreams, uh, uh, there's no cricket in which I play. I think I miss... I was so sad when he died and it was kind of rattling to remember that we had talked about it in that interview. He'd been for some counselling with a psychologist and had to think about his own death. And the first question he, he said, you got to write this, he said, you know, write your own obituary. I went, uh, right. And I, I had a few goes at it. Um, and I didn't like, at that stage, I wasn't happy with who I am. And I felt I needed to change. I needed to do a few things and be better. And I've tried, you know, and I've tried and I think I'm doing a pretty good job. He was unsure about leading into that interview, how it would go, where it would go, given um, how respected a journalist you are in the program and he's had so many of these different tabloidy interviews. He was unsure, maybe a bit nervous, but I spoke with him after it and he couldn't have been more pleased with... He just felt like that you got him. You, you, you just worked out and... and realised who he was. He, he really enjoyed it. Well, it was definitely a, a career highlight for me, so thank you very much.
There's a lot of waiting around sometimes for the big celebrities and my producers know I get antsy if I'm sitting around because it gives me too much time in my own head and my nerves get out of control. Come on, Elton, who do you think you are? Billy Joel. Fantastic shoes. Does it still give you a buzz when you hear 200,000 people sing along with Rocket Man or, or a song like that, or do you ever get used to that? It's gotten better. It's gotten at the beginning of the, uh, my career. People used to sing along to Rod Stewart's records all the time, knew every word, and I was so uh, uh, pissed off with him. Um, not that it was his fault. I used to say to him, "It's not fair. I can hear the, you get the audience to sing it. You just hang the mic out." <laughs> and as I, my career's gotten older, yeah, you can hear the uh, audience singing Tiny Dancer, your song, and it's wonderful. Listen, it's thrilling that a career has lasted this long. Hello, nice lady. Really nice to meet you. Good, how are you? Are you ready for 7.30 style grilling? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. I've been watching you, don't worry, I've been taking lessons. Good, it's all about the budget. I've got it, yes. I've got everything solved. <laughs> When celebrities walk into a room, you never know if they're going to be aloof and cold or friendly and chatty. Usually they're lovely. Well, Linda, my makeup artist, her family's from the same village as you in Austria. The question is, did you see the Schwarzenegger Museum? <laughs> no, I didn't. You did not. You see, that is uh, terrible. Lovely to meet you. Take it back so I can see you on Christmas. Make sure it's one last. Okay, we right, everyone? I really cannot bear any interruptions once the interview has started because if I've worked hard to relax the person, it can wreck that, although not always. Never pay any attention to the camera guys because <laughs> they would tell you over and over something is wrong and let's reshoot it, let's do this and let's do that. Hey, just do it. Are you listening to this, guys? <laughs> okay, let's call it. Action. Action. Arnold Schwarzenegger, lovely to meet you. Thank you. Renee Zellgub. <laughs> Sorry, it'd be helpful if I get your name right. Yeah, I do it too. Let's just get your name right to start. Oh, isn't that the interview? I thought we were. <laughs> oh, shit. I love it if the talent plays ball and they can make a joke. It helps so much. Are you going to put your more serious voice on yes, now? Yes, I am. Shit. My voice is going to drop about an octave. <laughs> be a little less, little less Queenslander. Oh, oh. <laughs> I've got a confession to make to you. Oh my God, what is it? We have actually met once before. Channel Here 9. Here we go, people. <laughs> it was Channel, <laughs> Channel 9 in um, Brisbane. Oh, look at PJ, he looks so young. Oh, look at me, I look like another person. What do you think it is about the film that makes people like it so much? <laughs> I think everyone feels like Muriel at some stage. How cute are we? <laughs> You're Your baby. Cute. I apologise for inflicting that haircut of mine on you. <laughs> and I remember that because um, I loved Muriel's wedding so much, and you were so mature and gracious, and I asked the dumbest questions in the world. That's so, yes, I'm, amazing. I'm... <laughs> we write music to connect too. You know, we're. I find that I'm getting more and more connection out of it, to to, as well. So I I think I feel really grateful for that. Well, it's a good place to be, obviously, where Thanks. you are now. So. Thanks. So I'm sure I'll have a nervous breakdown next week. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know. And then I'll be like, oh, he didn't tell me about the drug and the alcohol problem. Thanks for the scoop, yeah, yeah, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a drinking problem. I have a stopping problem. <laughs> <laughs> Barnsey's wife wanted me to play with him and I was reluctant because, you know, Barnsey. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. I said, what song? He said, any song. I said, what key? He said, any key. So, you know, there was no excuse. And of course, what a thrill. How lucky am I? that day that I interviewed Paul McCartney, it still makes me tear up with joy, actually. I can't even tell you, getting to play that piano from Magical Mystery Tour, knowing the history, knowing that McCartney plays it every night. Does it feel magic for I'm you? Getting back it feels totally magic. <laughs> With a celebrity interview, you have so little time with them. It's always a big challenge to make a genuine connection. I think I had about 10 minutes with McCartney. It had to be done on stage, standing up. It was going kind of just 
okay. And then I asked this one question, and I don't know why, he just connected with it, and then it was magic from there. Lots of people have anxiety dreams about their work. Do you ever find that you do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, ever since I started performing, you all, there's like a recurring dream, which is, and I still have it to this day, which is um, you're in a stadium and you're playing, you know, with the Beatles or with the band, and people start leaving. And it's like, okay, what are we doing wrong? What's going on? And it's like, oh, quick, you know, we're trying to pull out the big one. Quick, <laughs> hey, Jude, quick. Hey, Jude. Beatles songs have so much meaning for people. Does it ever become bothersome when people want to come up to you and say what a song has meant to them or they're very emotional about it? No, it's great. I mean, you know, you write a song kind of for yourself because it's a very magical process, you know. You write it and then you release it to the world and it is very special. And I don't think you ever get fed up with that. I have never interviewed someone of whom I'm a bigger fan than you. Thank you for all of those songs and for making time to speak to us. It's just been so unbelievably thrilling. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Because a kiss. <laughs> Come on. Do it. All right. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thank, Thank you. you. I have got nothing after that. <laughs> Good night. to keep track of everyone who's been on the show. Well, thank you so much for, for talking to me. You've been very kind and very nice. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charmed. Thank you. Prime Minister, we very much appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Some interviews never leave you. I have a photo on my notice board of Betty Churcher. I interviewed her in 2015, just before she died. Beautiful woman. What's been occupying your thoughts over these past few weeks? Well, I have been thinking about it. I'd be very interested at that moment of Passover. You know, I just don't know what's going to happen there. But I do know that I've had a very long and fruitful life. How incredibly fortunate for you that you have had a life and a career around something that you have loved so much. Lee, don't I know it. It's been such a delight and privilege to get to come down and talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, very much too. You're an argumentative <laughs> lot, aren't you? I lose it all the time after interviews, but only once on air with Blanche Delpuget. And it was partly because I'd been talking to Bob Hawke before the interview and he was so frail and they'd been so gentle and loving with each other before we were rolling. We spoke before about your and Mr Hawke's great love. I hope this isn't an, an indelicate question, but have you thought about or discussed what's going to happen because one of you will die first and what happens to the other one? Indeed. No, I have. We've discussed it. He has no fear of death, and we've and we've talked about it quite a lot, and uh, we've talked about the, his his funeral, and what he would like, at it, to happen at his funeral. I've bought the graves, and I'm going ahead and and planning that. How do you think you would go on without him? With difficulty, Lee. With difficulty. He, he, oh dear. Oh, sorry. That's all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> He, he's my best friend. It strikes me that the flip side of having been so fortunate to have such a great and wonderful love, I'm so sorry that I've made you upset. Um, it strikes me that the flip side of that is that later on you just have such intense suffering. That's right. Look at us, what a couple. <laughs> and you <you're> crying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought it on myself by even raising that. <laughs> anyway, um, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for talking to me and I hope I didn't overstep the line by asking about that. No, no, that's <laughs> oh, Sorry. Do you want us I'm to do sorry. a goodbye that's not so emotionally raw? Yeah, no, we don't need it right now. No, we're just kidding.
I wanted to re-record because I was embarrassed I'd cried, but she insisted it stay. Um, I think it was rather fun that we were both. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's, nobody's ever actually made me cry in an interview before. I've had to suck it back. <laughs> Right before the 2019 federal election, both Scott Morrison and Bill Shorten had their final campaign interviews on the program, and word came through while we were live that Bob Hawke had died. I'm backing them, and I'm asking them to back me on Saturday. Scott Morrison, thank you very much for your availability to 7.30 during the campaign. Thanks very much, Lee. Always a pleasure. It's my very sad duty to break the news this evening that the former Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke has died aged 89. His wife Blanche Del Perge issued a statement a short time ago. Mr Hawke uh, was... I had to announce the news from the standing spot, so I had about 10 minutes to sit on the floor of the studio, scribbling down dot points off the top of my head so I could make the announcement and give it the weight it deserved. Along with his treasurer, Paul Keating, they introduced an enormous series of political and economic reforms which paved the way for the modern Australia in which we all live today. Blanche, I'm sorry to see you under these circumstances. Blanche wanted to speak again the following week. What was the final year of Mr Hawke's life like? It was, it was both difficult and it was also one of the best times of our lives because we were so close and intimate during that time while I was his ma main carer. And we often, often said to each other, we've been blessed to have this period together. We, we didn't... Now, Lee, you're going to make me cry. I'm, not try I'm trying not to. I'm trying really hard not to, so I'm sorry. OK, well, we didn't have the joy of young love. He had that with Hazel. But we had the joy of mature love and then the love of old age. And people don't realise... Now, I really am not going to cry... ..how wonderful it can be to look after somebody you love when they're old and dying. The team at 7.30 works so hard to help viewers make sense of a world that feels less stable. Where are we and where is ISIS? We question the use of power. Can you please stand back a bit? Thank you. Why did you do that? Please respect this press conference. Any other questions? Yep. And we've been there when communities have been devastated by fire, drought and flood. So I don't know how we can carry on. <laughs> Some of my last programs were about unprecedented floods in eastern Australia. So it's ending the way it began, because that was my very first program too. And that's all for this National Bulletin for now. More on the floods from ABC's Brisbane newsroom shortly, followed by a one-hour edition of the 7.30 report. Hello, I'm Lee Sales. Welcome to this ABC Current Affairs special, bringing you the very latest on the Queensland flood. I could not have imagined all those years ago when I started all the ways the world would change and the way my own life would too. Of all the amazing people I've met, some of the most amazing are the people I work with every day. Reporters, producers, people you've never heard of who work behind the scenes. They contribute so much to what you see on air and they are what I'll miss the most about 7.30. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's hilarious. As for what comes next, who knows? That's the beauty of news. That's the program for tonight. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow, but for now, thanks for your company. Until then, good night. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.